Okay. Now, I've, I've invited each panellist to address us for two or three minutes, uh, saying what they want to say about the wider UK. They're likely to touch, as is this discussion, on the panel discussion this morning. That's fine. They want to reflect on that. And then I may have a couple of questions, uh, but I'm hoping to engage the audience as soon as we possibly can. So I will kick off, Simon, with you, if you don't mind. And then we'll go Kirsty, later, and then Paul. Um, uh, I thought you were going to ask me a question, but uh, I'll answer it. Um, uh, I was fascinated with this is the early discussion. Um, coming from London, um, I, I come as a foreigner. I'm very careful how I claim a license or no license in these topics. Um, but, um, but I'm very much a culture I have to say. I mean, I do think this has been grossly overplayed as a great national crisis. Um, the, the pace at which politics moves on from a, from a crisis, as everyone has described, that is always underrated. I just somehow feel, in two or three months' time, whatever happens next week, we'll go on to something else. Um, essentially, to, to, to London, anything to do with the provinces, the, 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 the nations, local government is boring. Um, for the moment, Scotland is brilliantly uh, enlightened, but it will pass. Uh, I think Devo Supermax, as I call it, an independent light, as we can also call it, will end up being much the same. There will be a huge getting together, there may be a second referendum, whatever it is, there will be an arrangement. Um, all the things that Project Fear said wouldn't happen will happen. Um, a lot of things that the SFP said um, promised won't happen. Um, there will be a tremendous convergence of two people who, who, who one of them has had enough of the other. But essentially, um, there's, there's too much in common there to be a breach. So I think that, that's not really a big thing. The question, uh, which also came up uh, earlier on, of, is there anything new here at all, such that Wales, or for that matter, England, you know, England cities might grab that? I do think, I really do think, that the shock has been delivered to London, and I see this through London's eyes, London is so detached from this debate, you, you cannot exaggerate it. You wouldn't get a room that was like going in London, it just wouldn't at the moment. Um, but um, I do think they had a terrible shock. And the shock is essentially the, 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 the central syndrome shock. Uh, and I do think there's an opportunity. Um, and I think the opportunity is, in some sense, to refashion localism within the United Kingdom. Um, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, you can kind of see it. England, you just can't. Um, regionalism is out. It, 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 there's absolutely no sense of regional identity in England. The question is what you do with local government. And the only thing you can do with local government, and it's perfectly doable, is simply decentralise a certain amount of taxation and power. Um, and I just think we, we should and we might even go back to pre-83 pre settlement to allow uh, local taxes to rise in accordance with local wishes, um, to decentralise taxation, to decentralise some other revenue stream. Um, and to decentralise some powers. Um, and I think that, it, that, that really might happen. Um, as far as Wales is concerned, I think the real problem is nobody knows what Wales really wants. In Scotland, you knew, uh, you knew the, the, the end game in Scotland, was independence. Uh, rather get it or you don't. Uh, in Wales, uh, I get no sense of there being an end game. Um, I, I really don't know what business wants. I, I heard Carol on the, on, on the radio the other day something unbelievably hesitant. Um, and I just thought, well, what, what, does, what does he want? And even in the end, um, this morning, I wasn't quite sure where she was going. And I think, I think the real opportunity for Wales, uh, this is my last point, is, is you want a convention, have a convention. Stop waiting for someone to give you a convention. What's the matter with you? Have a convention. Uh, decide what it is you want to do, uh, and then present it to London, and just at this particular moment in time, just not get it. Kirsty. Well, I'm not quite so relaxed that uh, in three months' time we'll look back on all of this and we'll wonder what the whole fuss uh, is about. And I feel uh, anxious about it because I am worried about what will happen to Wales in this process uh, post the outcome of the referendum. I'm not worried about the Scots and I'm sure there will be discussions and they will become an amicable way forward north of the border. But my concern is what is Wales's place in that and how do we get Wales's voice heard in that? Because uh, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but I bear the scars on my back. I know how difficult it is to get Welsh voices heard uh, in Westminster. And actually, sometimes, it, for most of the time, it's not the politicians in Westminster that you've got to worry about. You've got to worry about Whitehall. That's the people that you've got to convince in all of this. And that has been, I think, incredibly difficult, regardless of who is uh, trying to have those negotiations. So I'm less relaxed about that. But I do absolutely agree that the challenge is... 
for Wales being absolutely clear about what <coughs> devolution looks like for Wales. And we are at our best and we are at our most successful as a nation in securing those powers when we can build on a consensus. And that does mean sometimes that political parties have to compromise. You know, uh, we had to compromise when uh, we had the, the first refer referendum. Uh, people have had to compromise in the second. Um, but we are at our best when we can find a way of coalescing together and speaking with one voice. There was incredible uh, incredulity on behalf of Westminster uh, about the setting up of the Silk Commission. I remember having a very frank conversation when people said, you know, forget it. People uh, in Wales aren't interested. Nobody can agree. But actually, uh, you know, getting the three party leaders and the uh, interim party leader into a room, we were able to be able to, you know, thrash that out. And I think actually we don't necessarily need a convention in the sense of deciding what we, where we want to go in Wales because I think we haven't got time for that. It's too critical, it's too time critical, and I think we have to work on what we have got, and that is, uh, Rob says it's out of fashion and it's yesterday's way of doing things, but I think the Silk Commission, uh, part one and part two, is the basis of that. I don't think we need to have another commission. We need to grasp the opportunity of the work that has already been done. There is a generally broad consensus uh, around that. People will have to, individual party leaders and parties will have to look, at, look to themselves and study and compromise once again, like we always have. But I think that is what we can coalesce and work forward. What is not the way to do it is unfortunately, and I know that he's sincere about having extra powers for Wales, but demanding that we're offered the same in one voice, but then turning around and saying, but actually, no, we don't want it, is not a credible way to negotiate with Whitehall or the politicians in Whitehall. We have to stand up with one voice, and I would suggest at this stage, uh, the best that we've got uh, is Silk 2, uh, and that is the blueprint of where we could be working from and what we could be demanding of Westminster. But I do agree, now is the time to do it. We have to do it, otherwise we'll be left behind. I was only joking about Silk Commission to get my cheap crack about fag packets in, so just uh, <laughs> there are people from the press here, okay? But, but right, uh, uh, Leighton, but I, in the interest of balance, I omitted to say, just in case anyone's in any doubt, that Leighton Andrews is the Labour AM for London. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> you have to understand that I prepared my remarks as a backbencher. <laughs> <laughs> I now represent the government, so I may be a lot more boring. Um, I, I think that I'm going to say roughly six or seven things. If we want a United Kingdom to exist, we need a new union based on popular sovereignty and a new political culture to sustain it. And the London-based media needs to learn to le nurture and sustain that new union. And we need a radical reform of Westminster political institutions to underpin that. Am I optimistic that that can happen? No, but I think it's worth arguing for. Popular sovereignty. The new union needs to be one in which the constituent parts have, con have consciously entered. The philosophy of Westminster sovereignty is finished, as Gordon Brown has said in his book, we know that in respect of Wales, of course, because the Supreme Court has demonstrated that on a number of judgments, siding with Wales uh, rather than uh, the UK government. The First Minister is right to call for a UK constitutional convention. I think there should have been a constitutional convention before the referendum on independence in Scotland was agreed, but it didn't happen, uh, and I think we are heading to a looser union. Not so bothered about the size of the House of Commons, which is more or less on a par with the Assemblée Nationale and the, the Bundestag. But the House of Lords, 850 members, is a constitutional monstrosity. It needs to be scrapped and replaced with a smaller democratic body representative of the nations and regions of the UK. Also, Westminster, UK cabinet ministers need to understand when they are genuinely UK ministers, like the foreign and defence secretaries, or whether they are ministers who have to deliver UK or great British responsibilities in cooperation with devolved administrations, like the Department for Work and Pensions, or largely English ministers like education and health. And that takes me to England. England needs some kind of democratic space, as my colleagues John Denham and John Cruddus have said. And I think the chaos on the political right at the moment, uh, with the defection to UKIP, the by-election on October the 9th on David Cameron's birthday, uh, those things are demonstrating that there is a new debate going on in England. Simon is absolutely right, of course, to talk about what, what you do as a, in terms of a democratic space. Is it around local government? It's a debate for the English to have. 
A philosophy of English exceptionalism is no basis on which to hold together a political union. And the London-based media has been wholly complicit uh, in that philosophy. I read a lot of sanctimonious editorials on Monday uh, in the London newspapers following the first uh, opinion poll showing a possible vote in favour of independence. Uh, they were sanctimonious about Westminster politicians. Okay, Westminster politicians, I think, have to a large extent ignored devolution over 15 years, many of them. Uh, but those, you, those London newspapers certainly have. Uh, they have steadfastly ignored devolution for the previous 15 years, noticing devolution only when they, we have used our powers to do things they don't like. For example, protecting Welsh students against higher tuition fees, which was denounced, of course, as educational apartheid in a number of newspapers. So London media needs to learn, though I doubt, I'm afraid, that the Telegraph, Mail, Times or Sun will do so, that being advocates for a chunk of the disgruntled English is not likely to nurture pride in a new union. So, to summarise, constitutional convention needed to, give a, to create a new union based on popular sovereignty and a written constitution, a reform of Westminster institutions, including replacement of the House of Lords, some kind of space for England, a new culture of openness, recognising diversity and difference within a looser union, an end to the metropolitan provincialism of the Westminster political media complex. All of those things I'd like to see I'm not necessarily optimistic that they will happen. Thank you. Paul. Thank you, Rob. Well, uh, Lee said earlier on that he'd tried to find a Conservative speak, and he'd tried seven people, and then eventually came to me, I'm afraid. So I don't know whether I'm supposed to speak on behalf of a party that uh, embraces everybody from David Melding to Liam Fox. I'm not going to try to do that. Uh, but I'm, I'm the ersatz Conservative here today. Uh, I think that... Um, one of the things I would say in praise of, of, of the Prime Minister is the maturity in holding the referendum. The willingness to hold a referendum, I think, was uh, something which could be emulated by many other countries. If I wasn't originally going to be here, I was going to be in Georgia this week. Uh, Georgia and its relations with Russia, uh, gosh, they have something to emulate from the way in which Scotland has a relation with uh, the rest of the UK. <coughs> As everybody said earlier on, I think the engagement, the level of engagement that there was, uh, there has been in Scotland is something which is quite a, 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 an example to us all of how politics could become more engaged. Now, is that going to result in a more plebiscitary politics in the future? Are people going to want to uh, have a greater say in the way in which things are done rather than leaving it to elected politicians? I've thought for a long time that the, 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 the death of representational politics is is around the corner. I just wonder whether the referendum in Scotland is another step towards that death of representational politics. Answering the question of, about what this means to the rest of the UK, what about yes? I think that yes, and it would really be yes by a narrow majority, yes would mean a reopening, as somebody said earlier on, of some of the questions that we uh, perhaps avoided before we started asking the, uh, whether there should be a referendum. I think some of the issues about whether enough people were uh, uh, voted yes will be reopened, and uh, I don't think that uh, the British state will simply relax and allow Scotland to go. I think there'll be an extremely complex process to follow. Uh, if you look at what the Constitution Committee of the House of Lords has said, uh, a committee chaired by Ian Lang, who of course was a former Secretary of State for Scotland, has written a letter a couple of weeks ago to the Times talked about letters at the Times, uh, Ian Lang, Michael Forsyth, and uh, Malcolm Rifkin wrote a letter saying this is an incredibly complicated process. I think that legislation, uh, which would follow a yes vote, will take a very long time. If you look at that Constitution, Constitution Committee's report, they say in that that uh, nothing should be hurried. Uh, and as Kirsty has said, the resistance that there will be among uh, Whitehall officials, we saw that when we did our commission work, uh, will be uh, in spades uh, to uh, a freedom, um, uh, do I mean freedom, uh, 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 a bill which enables Scotland to be independent. How will the rest of the United Kingdom function? Uh, well, it can't function with just Wales and England. Uh, Northern Ireland, I think, would there be a real existential problem for the unionist side in Northern Ireland and the nationalist side in Northern Ireland <coughs> will uh, see uh, the possibility of the reunification of Ireland. 
great problems, I think, in Northern Ireland, if there's a yes vote. Uh, leaving Wales and England as a unit, unit Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Tanzania, the only countries I can think of where there are two uh, so e unequal partners. So I think there's a, there's a grave problem for uh, England and Wales left as a polity in the future. And I think one of the possibilities that might come out of that, I think there is a possibility of a, a, a greater desire for independence in Wales, but there's also a possibility, I think, for a greater desire of assimilation with England. Yeah. So there could be a less powerful Wales following a yes vote, as well as a more powerful Wales. Uh, Devo Max, uh, uh, the no vote, Devo Max, uh, what's the English view of that? And we heard somebody's alluded already to what uh, uh, John Redwood was saying. What is going to be the English view of Devo Max? We've told that everything will be done and dusted by St. Andrew's Day or Burns Night or whatever it is. Uh, I, I doubt that. I think there will be a lot of English MPs who will not want to see that happen. It can't happen without due process. Uh, and if it does happen with due pro without due process, my goodness, what does that open up about the questions about the sort of process that we in our commission set up for some of the things that we were proposing should be done in Wales? Uh, the English Parliament, well, there was a report by uh, uh, a friend of mine, another former clerk in the House of Commons, Bill Mackay, about uh, English votes inside the House of Commons. That rather has passed people by, but it was a very good report, and I think if that is implemented, we could see uh, the Parliament, we present, the House of Commons that we presently have, and uh, I would go further than Leighton about the House of Lords, I'd abolish it and have a unicameral Parliament, but uh, uh, <laughs> it, the House of talk. Commons uh, could work very well uh, under the Mackay proposals with English members being uh, responsible for matters that affect England only. One thing I do see as a possibility in the House of Commons after a no vote is a backlash uh, in Scotland. And don't forget, 53 of the directly elected members of the Scottish Parliament uh, are members of the SNP. Could we see 53 directly elected members of the House of Commons from the SNP following a yes, yes vote? And could the SNP be holding the balance of power inside the House of Commons after the, the general election next year? In the event of a narrow no vote, um, it seems to me that, as somebody said from the floor this morning, that the, the, the West Lothian question is put particularly acutely then. And in my view, it's unlikely that England, English representatives, will put up with that uh, anymore. That may in turn place particular pressure on any future Labour government or Lib Lab government, given Scottish representation. But let's set the politics up just aside for a moment, the party politics. But isn't it the case that it's difficult for the uh, British establishment to sort of think, buy the Scots off with the Dane Gelt and then think, oh, we can carry on? Because the English genie will be out of the bottle there. So, Simon, I think you've written on that recently. I mean, I agree. I, I do. I, 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 to be honest, we don't know what we're talking about. Um, this is new territory. Yep. Uh, it really is. Um, I mean, I, I said before, I think it won't change much. I think most ordinary people in, Britain, in England and probably in Scotland and Wales won't notice an awful lot different in three months or six months' time. Um, I, I do think the political community will um, notice things are different in precisely the terms you say. Um, one of the curiosities about Devo Max is, is it, 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 everybody presents it as some panacea of pain-free devolution. It's bloody painful because all the cats are out of the bag. In the first place, you've got the problem of the subvention. Never discussed either in Scotland or in Wales, whenever these, 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 these problems come up, some are under the assumption that the money is going to go on gushing. That's going to stop. If there's one thing that the English MPs are going to be absolutely insistent upon is that sort of thing stops. Um, if you think you want powers, you don't get the money. And that, that's, it's going to be an absolute... I mean, the, the, the East Asian questions out here are there compared to that. The, the Treasury is sitting there waiting to, to pass. And I think that's, that's the most important thing to realise. Uh, and and you, you, you see it definitely in Carmen's nervousness um, on, on what, you know, give me the powers, but I may not take them. Why not? You know jolly well what happens if you take income tax powers. Um, th 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 there's going to be you know, a different sort of lockstep. They'll just top slice your, your suspension. So I think, I think a, lot of, a lot of this has to be seen in realistic terms. I mean, the, the, the SNP have been very careful to ban all their yes campaigners from ever saying anything negative about, about, um, about independence. Um, 
you know, the morning after the night before is going to be very painful. And I do think at some point that's going to come home. Uh, Leighton, you mentioned um, <clears throat> some of the, I think, very interesting work by John Crudus within your own party, and it is very interesting, but I may be wrong here, and I'm happily, ha happy for you to, to, to correct me, but I don't see any great sign that that thinking is having any significant traction on the UK leadership of the Labour Party, and it, it seems to me that it needs to have, if, um, as somebody said this morning, social democracy uh, has, has, has got some kind of chance in a, in a United Kingdom or rest of UK, but it, it needs to, to avoid this uh, West Lothian question being posed at its most critical, doesn't it? Well, I think I'd say watch this space. I think that th there has been a shock to um, the Westminster political leaderships over the last few days, and I think you, you saw, you, you've seen that in, in uh, what happened yesterday. Um, I, one of the things I disagree with Paul about is I don't think um, Cameron was skillful in respect of granting the referendum. Um, because, you know, there could have been three choices. There could have been Dima, Diva Max. And I, th that, that referendum was agreed between the government of the UK and, and Scotland without any reference to anybody else, uh, as to, clearly without any thinking through what the implications might be. It was clearly an assumption uh, that Scotland was going to vote no. And, uh, you know, that was, I think, a very extraordinary and incompetent uh, decision. As for the West Lothian question, I honestly think that at the moment... Um, I mean, I, you know, I respect and, and accept a lot of what Simon has just said about the reaction in England. But I actually think that the crisis on the political right is acute. You know, the UKIP split, the Conservative Party doesn't know where it is or what it wants. Um, it is clearly going to be, it looks like very much like it's going to be a UKIP by-election victory in October. So we're not just looking at next week's vote in Scotland, we need to look on into October. What does that then mean into the run-up uh, to uh, a UK general election. And I take Paul, uh, what I do agree with Paul, is that if it's a close no, um, even if the SNP doesn't do well at a UK general election, there is a very strong likelihood they will do sub very well at the subsequent Scottish parliamentary election in 2016. And are we then in never-endum territory, you know, where we just have a repeated referendum until things change? I think we are in a period where we don't really know what the, like, the outcomes are likely to be. I do think the only way to work your way through that is to decide that you want, uh, on the assumption that there will be a no vote next week, a new union a new, and a recasting of those institutions. Okay, but let, let's, let's talk about this convention idea, <clears throat> which one or two poured cold water on this morning, but let, let's, let's keep the hair running. Kirsty Williams called for some consensus. You've already got it because you both want to... Um, uh, a, a constitutional convention at UK level of some kind, uh, and uh, both of you, in different ways, I think, are, are talking about some kind of federal uh, settlement, ultimately, as, as sort of the, the desired end game. But isn't any convention, I mean, it's also a question about who's on it, are they elected, and is it just the great and the good again, or whatever. But isn't it stymied now from the start because the Dane Gelt promise has already been made? Well, they, the, the Scots keep the Barnet money. Uh, they, 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 they have full fiscal autonomy as well. Uh, they have everything bar foreign affairs, but they've they got welfare, they've got the lot. So any convention which wants to unpick that and alter that is skewered, frankly, isn't it, Kirsty? But, but don't believe it. <laughs> don't believe it. I mean, the English government will have you on that one. It really will. I mean, uh, Jerry agrees, but there's no way you can get Devo Max and keep the money from the present rate. Well, we, we, we could talk yeah, about sorry, Scottish yeah. backlashes then, but Chris, you, you can almost speak for the UK government, I think, so let, let's see what you've got to say about that. <laughs> my, li my life would have been a lot easier over the last couple of years if I could do that uh, com completely, believe me. I, I think the choices are you either end up with a bilateral communication convention style, if, you, if there's a no vote, then you have ongoing discussions between Scotland uh, and the UK government, and you arrive in those situations that Leighton just described decisions between the two that excludes uh, the need to address uh, the aspirations of the Welsh people and Northern Ireland and indeed the, the England and I think we cannot get away from the challenges that, that, that this is going to arise and that's why I think you have to have it on a, on, a, on, a, on a UK level because I just don't think the English are going to sit back 
and just accept that the money will keep flowing or, or the, pow I, I, the power will keep flowing, the Scottish MPs will continue to vote on English matters. I just don't think that that is going to happen. And therefore, it has to be, uh, I think, on a UK basis. Yes, my end goal would be a, uh, a, a federal arrangement underpinned by a, a written constitution that states quite clearly uh, the role of the centre as opposed to the power lying in the nation of, of, of Wales and addresses the issue uh, of what happens uh, within England. I think what will happen at the general election, actually, uh, if there is a no vote that Alex Salmond's pitch to the Scottish people will be, you have to send SNP members of parliament down there to keep these people honest, to make sure that they do everything that they said they were going to do. So I think, actually, that's what... Uh, some, some people I know, we've had discussions, whether it be about extra powers or Barnet, well, we've just got to get the other side of the referendum. It was quite clear to me it was never just about getting to the other side of the referendum because the pitch from Salmon was always going to be, now you have to, you know, we have to follow through on this and send a load of SNP members of parliament down to Scotland. So the problems aren't going to go away, certainly if there's a no vote. And even if it's a bigger no vote than perhaps all the polls are suggesting, because Salmon's next pitch will be about the general uh, election. So I think, I think that's what will happen, to keep them honest. And I just think, out of those two options, a bilateral negotiation between Westminster and Scotland or an all-UK uh, people's convention, uh, or whether it be the Irish model or, or another way of doing it, I think is a preferable option for Wales. But in sending people to that, in you know, arguing the case for Wales, we need to be clear about what we're arguing for. And that, I think, is the fundamental problem that we've got at the moment in Wales, is that there is no clear voice about what uh, the outcomes for Wales look like. And I think that is the greatest danger that we face at the moment. And I would again say the best hope that we've got is a coalescence behind the work that has been done. And I'm not just saying this to flatter him, and he is a constituent. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> all right, I am just saying it to flatter him, and he's a constituent. Uh, but, but Silk 2 proposals are, is what we've got, and there was cross-party representation on that, and I think that's the best hope that we've got is coalescing behind that. And it's not just about asking for more money or asking for the easy stuff that Jerry talked about. It is embracing that in its full. It is about doing the hard stuff in Wales as well. And if we don't, I think Paul is right, we will polarise. There will be a growth of demand for independence in Wales, but also all those no campaigners will look to push us back and look to see powers given back to Westminster. And that's why, for progressives, like like than me, we've got to agree on the way forward for greater devolution. Well, it, it appears you are agreeing in a convention, but I want to push away at this with Leighton now. But hasn't Gordon Brown sold the pass? Because he, the, the promises have been made now, which personally I think is very difficult to, for any party at UK level to roll back from, given the electoral threat of the SNP, even the event of a close no vote. But if I understand things correctly, Gordon Brown's also promised a convention just for the Scots, hasn't he? So how are we going to pull off a convention at UK level, which the Westminster establishment is really... Because effectively, it's almost an invitation for the establishment to abolish itself, and there is absolutely no historical track record of that happening in the UK. Well, that's about three or four different questions. I mean, Answer them all. Let's, let's just start with... Look, Gordon Brown is playing a really important role, I think, in the Scottish referendum campaign. I think he's helped to swing um, the swing to a degree the focus of, of some of the debate. Um, I, th I happen to think that um, we need to see where Scotland is uh, in, in eight days' time, um, and we need to see what has come out of that. Uh, the implication, there will have to be a series of discussions around um, what Devo Max looks like. I still don't quite know what Devo Max is, actually, because lots of people have different views on what Devo Max is. Um, but there will have to be a series of, of, of conversations around that. I think there has to be some kind of rational space within which we discuss these issues. Do we want a new union? Do the English actually want us? You know, I'd like to know that. I don't know sometimes at the moment. There are clearly some elements who don't. And, you know, and, but there is, if, if people value the union overall in these islands, and we'll have a better view on that in eight days' time, then there needs to be a discussion about what the union looks like going forward. Uh, and I don't think that you can kind of isolate specific uh, questions around, even Silk 2 at the moment, let me say, and you know, I know what the government position is, and I absolutely and thoroughly endorse the Welsh government's position <laughs> on Silk 2 today. today. Um, and, 
And, I'll and, give you a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but I can't, you know, I can't even tell whether Kirsty will have any MPs uh, in Wales at the next general election, or whether she'll have any Assembly members at the following Assembly election, uh, given the rise of UKIP at the present time in the polls. I don't know what the political space is going to be within which we're going to be negotiating. OK, well, I, I want to talk about the implications for leadership about that in a minute, but I just want to bring <coughs> Simon and Paul in here. It, it, so, Simon, you, you have greater expertise than, than many of us on the prospects of um, regionalism or city regionalism and so on in England. But let's say uh, there's a narrow no vote, the Scots uh, get neo-fiscal, full fiscal autonomy. Is there a threat to Wales there, and indeed elsewhere in the UK, if, say, London says, oh, we'll have that. that. That sounds quite nice. We'll keep all our taxes. I really fancy that. Or East Anglia or Kent. Uh, is there another genie possibly coming out of the bottle there? I, I, mean, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I did do prediction. This whole thing is about prediction. Very bad. Um, I, I, I simply think that, that, that a genie has come out of the bottle. Um, I don't think in England anyone has had any idea what to do with the genie. Running around Boris's mind, other curious places. Um, uh, and uh, and he said, yeah, Give me the powers. Well, he wants to get hands on Stanley, which is a vast amount of money in that. Um, the, the, I mean, I, 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 my first ever job was serving on the Great Deep Water Commission many, many years ago, where we did, did city regions. City regions have been around for most of my life. They never got anywhere. Um, they were introduced with Selnick and Merseyside and all these, all these rivers. Um, and, and it didn't really work. There was no sense of identity, there was no sense of accountability. Um, uh, when, when John Prescott tried to go to the East Region game, he thrown out a band, he was going to abolish the counties. Um, people don't think that way in England. Uh, they simply think of their town, or their city, or they think of their county. Those are the two institutions they, they recognise and respect. Um, and the old model of counties and county bodies worked. It should never have been abolished in my opinion. Idea. And the crucial thing about it are local property taxes. And those local property taxes have worked. And I, I still think if you went back to that, you'd solve a lot of these problems. The, the problem, I think, for Wales is that if, if, if Scotland is given serious power on the Dino Max, and for some reason or other, the Treasury continues its generosity for a time, um, well, the expectation is going to be Wales, what are you going to have now? And I think if Wales then says, well, well, we're not really sure about this after all. Um, I don't know, I mean, it's going to look very, very odd. I just don't know, I don't know what, the, what the general view of the English is going to be, or what the black view of the Russia is going to be. But, but you've clearly got this terror of, of, of fiscal sovereignty being reverted in any sense to all across the border. And I just think, well, it's simply got to make decisions what it wants. If you, don't, if you continue not to say what you want, it's as Jerry seems to win again. Paul, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that on the Silk Commission, that uh, we, we recommended the devolution of stamp duty, but kind of hoped that London would never get stamp duty on its own, didn't we? I mean, that, uh, that's probably the truth of well, it. You're right, Robert, that uh, we had a visit, I don't know if you were there, from the Greater London Authority, Greater London Assembly, I mean, who uh, said to us, well, this is a very good idea about devolving stamp duty land tax. Mm -hmm. We want it too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, not able to say, any cogent reason why London should not have it if, if Wales would have it, other than uh, you've got a hell of a lot more stamp duty land tax to, 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 to claim in London than we have in Wales. Um, I, I agree with what Simon said about uh, uh, the way local government has been uh, depowered in England. And uh, going back to what Cunard Davis said earlier on, uh, if city regions in England, how do they work for places like Herefordshire or Shropshire? Uh, they really don't. Uh, but in Herefordshire, people have a very strong sense of identity with Herefordshire and would like to see Herefordshire empowered. Uh, but they don't want to see that power going to Birmingham and then being some sort of adjunct to Birmingham. Can I just go back to uh, the, the issue of the convention. Uh, I've been reading James Mitchell's book about uh, the Scottish question. And what has struck me is how many conventions there have been in Scotland uh, through the end of the 19th and through the 20th century. I'd, I'd forgotten and never knew that there had been so many. And it's so easy for these things to be set up uh, after an, a, a cataclysmic event, after home rule all around. Uh, there was a speaker's conference which petered out, came to nothing. 
And it is possible, I think, that that will be what will happen after a no vote. There will be a convention set up once again, and nothing very much will happen because of the, as Kirsty said, the innate conservatism which uh, Whitehall always shows on these things. Final uh, question. Oh, uh, uh, go on. Uh, one, I think I can remember that something from that, from the Mitchell book, actually, the Stafford Cripps had said uh, that he wanted to see all the responsibility passing to a Secretary of State for Scotland, but no power passing to a Secretary of State for Scotland. <laughs> and I think that, that, that sentiment is still alive in, in Whitehall. Final question from me before I open it up. Um, whatever one's... Uh, Jerry Holton said this morning that, that he'd like to see people tend their own garden, as it was quite in Voltaire, I think. But it seems to me that part of tending the Welsh garden, politically now, is being mindful of the dangers and the opportunities in this very fluid situation external to Wales. And whatever one thinks of uh, political developments in Scotland over the last 15 years or so on, I think one can't deny that the national movement, if I can use that term, has been brilliantly led. You know, they've come from an absolute marginal political force to uh, uh, coming close to uh, decoupling from the state. What I'd like to ask each panellist, a very brief answer, is, well, what does leadership mean in Wales now? What kind of leadership should we be... What should leaders be doing in Wales in these circumstances? What should it look like right now? Well, I think it has to be prudent until we've seen the outcome from Scotland, firstly. Um, but I think it also has to be fixed not only on the question of uh, what powers we might want for Wales, but how does uh, the constitutional settlement across the UK look... Um, on a coherent basis. It's not just a, it's not just a question about having the debate about Wales uh, in the abstract, it seems to me. And I think that means an engagement across borders, within parties, uh, and it needs to uh, go as far as it possibly can, as Laura was saying about Scotland earlier, uh, beyond the established political parties. Kirsty? I think it needs to be competent, and I think it needs to be bold, and I think it needs to, uh, I would agree with Nathan, it needs to be outgoing and looking to reach out uh, and coalescing uh, people <coughs> with a view of what Wales wants and then being able to use that to back up their position in negotiations with Whitehall and Westminster. But it's got to be proven to be competent, consistent, and at this stage I think you need to be bold too. Paul. Uh, inspiring and visionary, I suppose, is what I would say leadership has to be. To, to, you have, if, if, you, if you want to, if, if you, leaders have to have followers, and people don't follow people who are not visionary and inspiring. And I, I'm not sure we have that quality of leaders in Wales. Simon. There are no adjectives there. It would be very good. Um, uh, I mean, the question I was asking would Scotland be where it is now without Alexander? And I, I just don't know the answer. But he's clearly been very important. I mean, he, he came out of London, he addressed the Guardian, the place almost stood up and roared. And a bit like Boris Johnson. I mean, some of these people have a way of capturing a public mood that very few other people have. Now, the only sensible question I have to ask in Wales' case is, is, is what do you want this person to do? I mean, do, do, you, do you want um, an Alex um, to, to, to run wild? Um, I think you probably don't for the reasons given. I think you, you do want a degree of caution. I have to say, I mean, it's quite nice to have an Alex Salmon of sorts You're coming out of Wales, and not the summer who goes up to London and works there. Um, uh, and, and, but, but above all, it, it, the, the thing that Salmon had, he had a very clear idea of what he wanted. He wanted independent Scotland, all right? I just don't know what anyone wants in Wales, and that's not been sorted out yet. Okay, who's going to be first? You've had your safe route. I'll see if I can do it later on. There's a, a gentleman near the window. If you could just say who you are as well. And I, I'm looking for um, short, snappy questions, not speeches, please. Yeah, my name's David Clebb. I'm Director of Renewable UK in Wales. And um, something a bit more prosaic. Um, we have um, targets for renewable energy in the UK, European targets for 2020. And of course, um, Scotland is flying away with its renewable energy. And it's on that basis that we're just about on track to meet our targets in 2020. But I suspect that renewable energy isn't the only sector where, if Scotland secedes from the UK, we're going to be vastly underperforming as what's left of the UK. 
I'm just wondering what the panel think is the resilience and the forethinking of, of Whitehall and the politicians in actually coming to grips with the magnitude of, of what the rest of the UK is going to have to achieve in order to meet its legal obligations. Okay, thanks. I'll take two or three in a row. The gentleman in front of you. Uh, Robert Bryn Jones, IWA member. Um, there was a comment made in an IWA blog uh, which basically said that what, whether this is yes or no, what will be revealed is the lack of political leverage we have in Wales. John Owens already referred to the lack of financial clout we have. Um, so it's difficult to see, in all honesty, where the leverage is going to come from vis-a-vis -vis Wales. Um, a solution to it would be um, a Wales Constitutional Convention, which would be along the Scottish model, which is inclusive not just of politicians but civil society. And I think that would give the politicians a basis for genuinely being able to negotiate with Westminster um, uh, rather than just on their, their party political basis. But as in Scotland, that would, that would involve the Labour Party in Wales taking a hegemonic view of their power and an inclusive view of their power. And whilst I may not doubt Cameron Jones's uh, desire to do that, I'm not sure his party are willing to go with him on that. Uh, the second point I'd make is regarding um, UKIP. I think that if there were an English parliament tomorrow, UKIP <coughs> would fade. I think it's just UKIP is basically the voice of England that doesn't have a voice at the moment. Thank you. Thanks. It, 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 convention's coming out, coming out of our ears, haven't we, today? But uh, uh, um, is there one more? I shall ask the, well, I'll ask the panel. So qu quickly, uh, 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 don't forget the question about the environmental targets, but um, a Welsh, Wales, new convention, Leighton? Well, I mean, let's be clear. On renewable energy, Scotland is doing very well with Westminster subsidies. That's the uh, that's reality. Um, and they would be lost if uh, there was a yes vote next, next week. Um, on, in terms of the, uh, the need for... The, I'm not convinced that Wales doesn't have clout, actually. Um, we have demonstrated our ability to make decisions that have been different from decisions taken at Westminster uh, in a number of, of areas. Um, I think we do have the clout that we need, but we do need to have clarity, but we need to have that clarity within the context uh, of knowing where we are after next week's vote and knowing where we are in respect of um, agreements across parties uh, you know, as, to, as to where the union is going. Simon could well be right, Jerry could well be right, that in two to three months, all of the kind of energy that has bubbled up in the last few days will have been uh, dissipated and things will, will have moved on. I think that would be a shame. I think there is a moment of opportunity here um, that I hope will lead to deeper uh, and more sophisticated proposals in respect of the future of the UK as a union, uh, which parties put in their uh, manifestos next time at a UK general election level. On UKIP, I think it's quite tempting sometimes to say, well, UKIP is just the voice of English disaffection. But let's remember, they've had an MEP in Wales since 2009, uh, and they've got an MEP in Scotland now. They are I think you know, there, there is a huge amount of very good work on the radical right that's being done, which demonstrates, by the way, that my own constituency is the most UKIP friendly, yes. arguably, in the whole, of, uh, the whole of Wales, certainly within the Labour Party. Um, and you know, the, the, on the votes in, 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 uh, in, in May, um, our, vote, our Labour vote went up in Ron the Cullen Taff, UKIP's vote went up, Ply Cymru's vote went down. Now, there, there is a disaffection out there which UKIP has captured, and they've not just captured it in England. I think it reflects the different stages of the constitutional debates uh, in Scotland and Wales. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the reality of this week has demonstrated the nervousness about the possible loss uh, of the union. Extraordinary headline did people see in the Telegraph at uh, the beginning of the week about um, the Queen must intervene. So that was going to kind of you know, resolve everything. Um, but, the, the, but the reality is, that the, I think the UK political establishment is shaken, uh, has been shaken earlier this week. You know, it may be, you know, it's flowing away now, but it has been shaken. And I genuinely think that the Scotland, where Scotland is with its constitutional arrangements uh, is a great concern, and that gives a degree of advantage to them in respect of the funding issues. Well, well, uh, well OK, I think I know who I'd back battle between Scottish Labour and Welsh Labour, but Kirsty, Scottish Lib Dems versus Welsh Lib Dems, no contest, is it? <laughs> it's, I think, I 
think uh, Leighton uh, is underplaying the difficulties that we have. And if he was uh, being upfront and honest, he would acknowledge that. And you don't need to take something as controversial as Barnet as an example. Uh, let's go back to renewable energy. You know, there has been a growing consensus in Wales over the years since the establishment of the Assembly in 1999 about powers over renewable energy and consents. You know, and the uh, previous Labour government uh, in Westminster was not convinced about that argument, despite the fact that Wales had put in the argument to them. You know, uh, we haven't been able to convince the coalition government of that particular subject either. And so Leighton says, oh, well, we've made decisions, we show things, we can do things differently. That's not the same as leverage. Of course, we can do things differently with the powers that we've got. But it has been a battle royal every time to be able to lever anything else out of Whitehall. And I think that's the honest uh, answer to that. And I think the ongoing issue around Barnet uh, is another example of that. And that is why Jerry has always been challenged. Jerry's always given to me. And I've always said it in the chamber. And Leighton has agreed with me in the chamber. In the end, you just don't need Welsh people saying you need to reform Barnet. You need the MPs in the North East and the North West and the South West also jumping up and down, demanding the change of the Barnet, uh, Barnet formula to even up that particular answer. And I think if Leighton was being completely candid, he would acknowledge that. Of England, presumably. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, right. We're going to go... Uh, yes. Um, Who are you? <laughs> in defence of... Um, in defence of a, a cautious approach rather than the bold, uh, dynamic leadership that some people are, are calling for. Uh, those, of you who, th <laughs> those of you who uh, play cards now and again, uh, uh, play bridge, if you've got a really good hand, you go out there and you play your hand aggressively. If you've got a really poor hand, the sensible thing to do is to be very, very cautious and watch what other pl people are playing. Now, I think uh, Carwin is being a good card player. And I think that the calls for other, much more bold responses and consensus that we'll take on is not realistic. Um, but if you don't, ex but some parties may find it advantageous to pretend otherwise uh, if they have no prospect of being in power. I'll, I'll take that as an observation. One, one, <laughs> one, one could say part of the game is to try and secure a better hand, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, who, who's next? Must be somebody else. Yes, you must say who you are. Uh, Garen Talman Davis, uh, IWA. Um, uh, can I ask Simon, uh, I mean, you've made a case for uh, uh, localism and uh, uh, for local government uh, in England. Um, uh, what is your view of, of the recognition of England as an entity within the Union? Which way should that go? Um, I, I, was, I thought you were going to say uh, local government in Wales. It's also interesting. Um, I mean, one, of, one, of the, one of the reasons why it's I, on the back of the I, 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 I was sceptical I, I was sceptical about Diva Max to Wales. I mean, it's a small country. Much more important, it's, it's sort of three bits of country each of which relates in some sense to bits of England. Yeah. The integration between the Welsh political economy and England is so great, it's quite unlike Scotland. Yeah. And, and I, think, I, think, I think somehow or other, you, you just need to think clearly of these, these things through. The assumption that everything to do with devolution from London is to do with Cardiff. Yeah, right. is, 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 I just ask something wrong. But there's, there's so much ground to be covered in them. Forget the convention. But do you, what sort of tax freedom do you want? Do you want tax freedom for Gwynedd or for the whole of Wales? Uh, because it affects your relationship with Liverpool, Birmingham, Bristol, and all these things matter. If only we had the Minister for Local Government with us. Uh, uh, well, now then, come on. <laughs> well, we didn't get an answer on the English question, did we? But, um, but, but, but the, the only entity in England, uh, uh, other, than, other than Britain, is England. And I just with John Redwood there. I mean, the, 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 that's the single single thing that's most likely to come out of this great crisis is, is a recognition of England. Some, some of us, I'm sorry, so, some of us, Leighton, myself, Lee Watt, a number of other people in this room, two or three years ago, campaigned hard on the line that laws which only apply to Wales should only be made in Wales. And it, it's indefensible not to carry that argument over into England, it seems to me. It's, it's absolutely indefensible. And, and, and sorry, just speak, London, London, London is, is not really an issue. London is a city-state. People who live in London honestly don't know England exists. They think it's London. And, and the rest of England is there to serve London. 
And the reason why you've got this sort of crisis with Wales and, and Northern Ireland and Scotland is, is, is they're puzzled and they've suddenly forced themselves onto the agenda. The rest of England just hasn't. <coughs> are you passing on it, Minister? Or are you? I, I, I think there are real, look, there are real issues that uh, uh, about, I think it's a very difficult time to be anybody in local government at the moment. I mean, I genuinely think it is That's hard true. time to be a councillor. Uh, and I think that what we have got to do as we move forward on uh, any reform of local government in Wales, uh, have we've got to reinvigorate <laughs> and, an understanding of why we want uh, people to stand for local councils. And that, Simon's points about, um, you know, the, the powers of available local government are part of that. Um, I think there is a question, in, to my mind, <laughs> as to whether we need 200 full-time local politicians in local government, which is what we actually have with the cabinet system at the present time, you know, I think you can make a case that says that um, local government may, may have been more invigorated when there was a real role for backbench councillors uh, who now feel that they don't have that meaningful role. Um, so alongside the big kind of structural questions, then I think there are issues about how we empower councillors. Having said all that, look, we had a, we had a Simon was talking about what worked in England in, in terms of um, uh, the county boroughs and boroughs. Um, what we had in Wales until the mid-90s was eight county councils, and I can't remember how many uh, district councils it was. We then went to a system of 22 unitary councils. Uh, so from eight directors of education to 22 directors of education, eight directors of social service to 22. Was that a sensible reform of local government? I suspect not. Uh, I don't think anybody sensible would have done it. John Redwood did. Okay. We, we've, we've gone off piece of it, which is my fault, not, not the panel. Kirsty, very quickly. Uh, but I think it is a question that we also need to grapple with in Wales, that for devolution you cannot just mean that's power to Cardiff. One of the most effective tactics I ever employed against a Conservative opponent in an election was when they wanted to hand over running of our local health services to Cardiff. <coughs> and that sent a, sh a, a, a shock of horror through the room in Bilt Wells. Because whatever Powys LHB was doing to cock up, at least it was Powys people yeah, cocking up yeah, on yeah, behalf yeah. of our Powys <laughs> people. Absolutely. And the prospect of Cardiff, Cardiff of all places, making decisions about Powys local, local health services was an anathema to the people who I represent. And where I would disagree with Leighton, the whole debate about local government in Wales has been focused on structures, not on the functions. We have to be clear about what we want local government to do. Once we're clear about that, that's when you can draw the lines on the map. Drawing the lines on the map first is not the way to empower local government and make people want to stand for it. We, we risk confirming it's all Simon's prejudices Sorry. about well, Welsh people only been interested in their local patch. But uh, <laughs> Paul, quickly. Uh, I was just going to say in response to Garrett's question that I think Frank Field has recommended that the English Parliament should be based in, in the north. Yes. And I think that that would be a very, very sound thing to be done if there were such a thing as an English Parliament that is based away from London, taking away this London centric politics. Thank you. At this morning's panel, Lee was very cheeky at the end and asked people how they thought the vote would go next week. I'm going to do the same. Uh, so, Paul, what's going to happen? No idea. Thank you. <laughs> Kirsty. Too close to call. Simon. 50-50. <laughs> I think no will be in the majority. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks.